Lift high the name of Jesus. That is a new hymn that we're learning as a church, and you'll hear that one more through the coming weeks. Lift high the name of Jesus. And that hymn sheet is in your bulletin. Um, If you'd like to take that home and learn that song, we're going to be using it as a church. Good morning, church. Welcome to uh, WBC. My name is Joshua Strang, and uh, I'm a member here at uh, Wellsboro Bible Church. Um, And uh, how good it is to be here in the house of the Lord uh, to sing his praises and worship together with him uh, as one voice and as one body. Uh, This morning, um, I would like you to pull out your bulletin. Inside your bulletin, uh, there is going to be a blue quarter sheet of paper. Uh, That is a prayer card. Uh, Feel free to fill that out with uh, your name and any information that's on there. And if you have any prayer requests or any needs, uh, go ahead and write that. Fold that piece of paper in half and place it in the offering plate as it gets passed by um, in a little bit. Next, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to your left-hand side of each aisle. There's going to be a um, check-in tablet there. Uh, Again, take that tablet fill out some uh, information, and uh, that's just a way for the staff here at Wellsboro Bible to be able to uh, uh, see, what's, uh, see what's here and uh, be able to remember, um, I'm sorry, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Follow up, follow yeah, follow up with you if there's any uh, need for follow up or uh, anything like that. All right. Uh, next, uh, there, we're going to be having a members meeting on February 16th. Um, we're going to meet at 5 uh, p.m. for a meal at the uh, uh, Fireman's Annex uh, just beside the church on East Ave. And then following that, we will meet at the church at 6 p.m. for the members meeting. This is just a good opportunity, and I encourage you, if you are a member here at Wellsboro Bible Church, I encourage you to come out and uh, be a part of that. that. This is a meeting for the entire body to get together and to be able to see the way that God is working through our different ministries and uh, get the reports and different things from our elders. And uh, it's, a, it's a good time of information, but it's also a good time for us to uh, worship together. Um, and they're, they're always a good time. Uh, at this time, uh, I'm going to lead us in a time... Uh, a moment of silent reflection. Uh, This is a time for us to all just, I don't know about you guys, but when I come in here, sometimes I sit down, my mind is going a mile a minute about all kinds of different things that are going on, uh, maybe in my personal life or conversations that I've had out there uh, with my buddies. But this is just a good time for us to quiet our hearts, quiet our minds, and uh, just reflect on uh, who God is and uh, prepare our hearts and our minds to worship him. So uh, let's, uh, let's do that together. I will bless the Lord all, at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. At this time, we're going to uh, be led in a song of praise to the Lord. Um, We are going to be singing uh, Come, Praise, and Glorify. Uh, In this song, uh, I love the lyrics where it says uh, that we are to be uh, pure and blameless in his sight. And that's what he's destined us to be, pure and blameless. So go ahead and stand with us and uh, worship our Lord together and lift up his name. Lift your voices this morning and sing with us. Come praise and glorify. Come praise and glorify our God, the Father of our Lord. In Christ he has in heavenly realms his blessings on us poor. For pure and blameless in his sight, 
He destined us to be And now we've been adopted through His Son eternally To the praise of your glory To the praise of your mercy and grace To the praise of your glory sins, yet Christ saved us. He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And we give him praise as the church again this morning. And you know, our theme today is praise. And so our songs are laced with praise. The scripture is laced with praise. We are going to be praising him because of the the theme of this service this morning. So continue to worship with us. In, In your bulletin, there is a hymn sheet for a song called What Wondrous Love. What wondrous love is this? And this song is in a minor key, and it's just a, it's reflecting on the amazing love. What wondrous love that the creator of all things would die for his creation, would come for me and trade my filthiness, my filthy rags for his righteousness. And we all know as the church that if you're in Christ, you have his righteousness, not because of anything you've done, but because of who he is. We are clothed with his righteousness. What wondrous love. So sing this with us. I know there are some people out. I know many of you have beautiful harmonies. So we're going to sing this traditional hymn style this morning. So we're just going to hear the voices in the piano. So let your harmonies ring through this place. There's nothing like the voice of the church, the voices of the church praising God together.
for all that he has done as we learn more and more about him. You may be seated. At this time, I would like to call Ben and Leslie Garner up to the stage. Uh, ben is going to lead us in a prayer of praise this morning. Uh, I encourage you uh, during his prayer to uh, be thinking about the different attributes and uh, uh, parts of God and uh, that have touched your life this week. And uh, Leslie is going to lead us in a psalm, uh, Psalm 96. And uh, it is a psalm that uh, is about the, the uh, glory of God and how he deserves our worship and our praise. Good morning, church. As Mr. Joshua Strang just enlightened us, we are going to take uh, a moment here to pray a prayer of praise. So we're going to be considering the two texts that are going to be presented to us this morning through Psalms 96 and also through Judges chapter 5 as Mike presents God's word. So would you join me now in prayer and we'll walk through a prayer of praise. Let's pray. Father, this morning, it is good to be together in, in the house of the Lord, to gather together as a body of Christ. Lord, this morning, as we consider Psalms chapter 96 and Judges chapter 5, as Deborah and Barak worshipped you and accounted you your victory, we too recognize that we don't wage war against the wickedness of Sisera, but rather Satan and his army. We know that Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. All around us, men, women, and children are being devoured in different ways. And you've called us to engage the enemy, just as Deborah and Barak did in Judges chapter 4 and chapter 5. And we praise you this morning as God who defeated the army of Sisera, who made the modern sources of weaponry, iron chariots, useless, who caused the great enemies to be crushed. You are the same God. We praise you this morning as Father, as Son, and as Spirit. We have forgiveness for our sin. We have the family of God, which is a representation here this morning. We have your holy word, the scriptures. We have prayer and we have creation. And we praise you because all of which will be renewed when Christ returns to consummate the kingdom. 
Your word is living, it is active, and it is able to make us wise unto salvation through faith, which is through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And your salvation displays glory and wonderful deeds. And your salvation must go forth until the whole earth has heard. For great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. You are to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but you, you made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before you. Strength and beauty are in your sanctuary. You shrink into nothingness. We shrink in nothingness in comparison to you. Thank you, Father, for your righteousness that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we gather together this morning to praise you and to worship you through the teaching of your word. And we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of all the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Amen. At this time, we're going to have the opportunity to uh, fulfill this uh, psalm that we just uh, read, that Leslie read to us, and uh, sing praise to the Lord. We're going to stand and we're going to sing all praise to him. And we'll see through this uh, uh, song the way that God uh, created the universe and yet humbled himself to come to this earth and to be a sacrifice for us for our sin. So join us together as we sing this song. Whose power imparts the love of God. 
the spirit of all truth and peace, the fount of joy and holiness, to Father, Son, and Spirit now, our souls we live, our wills we Father, Son, to Father, Son, and Spirit now, our souls we live, our wills we bow to you, the triune God we make, with loving hearts our songs of He is good, and as we sing his attributes and we remind ourselves as a church, as we gather on Sunday and we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs together, our circumstances sort of fade, and I believe that's by design. We're commanded to do that because our circumstances in light of who God is are are simply, they just start to fade and they're not as important because we know that he is in control and he is good. So we're going to continue to praise him this morning as we've said. So sing with us in this next song. Oh, praise the name.
still sing his praise, not only, not only now in our circumstances, but forevermore. You may be seated. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, the lyrics in that song in the first verse when it says uh, that uh, he was Messiah still, but all alone, that, that kind of gets me. Uh, every time, but praise the Lord, he didn't stay that way. He rose three days later, as we just uh, sang in this uh, in this song. Uh, at this time, I'm going to call uh, Pastor Mike White to come up, and he is going to lead us this morning in a pastoral prayer. And uh, this is just a way of our church to pray and be encouraging to some other uh, churches and in the uh, community. And it's our way of being able to uh, build the kingdom for uh, for Christ. This morning, uh, we'll be praying in particular for Pastor Mark Cox. He's the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church up in Sayre, and we've recently been able to start a relationship with him, and he is just a man of God, and it's such an awesome thing to be able to partner with that church in trying to reach every man, woman, and child in this geography with repeated opportunities to hear and respond to the gospel. Secondly, we'll be, pre we'll be praying for Will and Kelly Tallman uh, in Papua New Guinea, and uh, we've been supporting them for many, many years. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you as the God who put the universe into existence, and you give us every breath. You sustain us. You give us the oxygen we need. You cause our hearts to beat. And we are so dependent on you for everything. And we praise you that you are the author of life and the author of salvation. We thank you for bringing us together as a church, that you have called us out of darkness and shown us your light. And our job is now to spread that light around the world, that we would take advantage of the relationships that we have, that we would share that awesome good news of the gospel. I pray that Wellsboro Bible Church would be a beacon here in Tioga County, and that you would use this church to spread your fame in this area. Lord, I thank you so much for our partnership with Calvary Baptist Church in Sayre. And I pray that you would speak through Pastor Mark this morning as he preaches your word. Give him boldness, give him clarity, and I pray that your spirit would work in the hearts of those people in his congregation and that they would go out from that place and share your word with everyone around them. I pray as he develops leaders and the leaders of his church develop leaders uh, through these classes that they've been doing every Saturday morning, uh, that you would use uh, those classes and these discipleship relationships to strengthen and embolden this body as they go out and spread the gospel. I also think of the Tallman family. I thank you so much for the partnership that we've had with them for so many years. And I pray for their continued ministry and outreach to the people of Papua New Guinea. As Will is currently out, away from his family, out in the jungle, uh, while they wait for a couple weeks, uh, give him safety, give him clarity as he works on uh, this language and, and putting it into scripture in their language for the first time. And I just pray that you would guide him as he shares Christ and that you would use this translation of the scripture to plant many, many churches in that region and that people who are once in darkness would see your marvelous light of the gospel. Uh, be with Kelly and their family as Will is away currently and that you would um, just guide and strengthen them. We praise you. We thank you for who you are and for the beauty of the gospel. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right, at this time, we have the opportunity to continue to praise and worship our Lord through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. So uh, if you are a guest here and you're a member at another church, then we would uh, ask you to go ahead and uh, save those uh, tithes and offerings for your church. Uh, and if you're a guest here today and do not belong to a church, then uh, feel no obligation to give. Uh, however, um, as members of the church, this is our opportunity. Our, our opportunity to share uh, in the praise and, and the furthering of the gospel uh, through our giving of our tithes and our offerings. 
uh, pray with me and uh, um, we'll ask God to use these tithes and offerings. Father, we just come before you today and uh, we thank you for uh, the gifts that you have given us. Lord, we just uh, pray that you would uh, receive these tithes and these offerings that uh, you would um, bless uh, the giver. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, as we as a church uh, uh, use these uh, gifts that you have given us, Lord, that you would um, help them to advance your kingdom. And in your name we pray, amen. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Holy Mount to 
This is Pastor Ben, our children's pastor, and he, I always forget to introduce him, and I get all kinds of flack for that, and I almost did again. So. I almost came out. I thought you were going to keep singing the song, so if you Pastor ever see ben. us back there, that was Pastor kinda... Ben, everyone, right here. Hi, children's good morning. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, this morning in children's ministry, so we recognize our responsibility is to equip you, the parents, the guardians, the older brother or sister, to train and equip your children to love and honor and obey the Lord. That takes place primarily in your home because you guys are with them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sunday mornings when we're gathered together, uh, we use the a curriculum called the Gospel Project, which walks our kids the whole way from nursery through sixth grade uh, through a three-year cycle of the Bible in its entirety. Each week we look for, we call them Christ connections, how the stories in the Old Testament point towards the coming of Jesus Christ. So this morning we're continuing in the Old Testament and we'll be in the book of Nehemiah and we just walked through Ezra last week and we're, cha- we're covering chapters one through six this morning and next week we will do the concluding chapters. And the way that we equip you parents to do that is as you register and check in your students for their safety, we have uh, your email address and weekly you will get an email that comes from the Gospel Project and ultimately it's from us, but it gives you discussion questions at home. So oftentimes when you're commuting back home to eat lunch or whether you're going to see family, you can start to debrief what you've learned this morning from Judges chapter 5. You adults will be learning that and you students will be learning from Nehemiah uh, chapters 1 through 6. So it gives you some conversation starters. It's another tool to help you equip and disciple your children. And before we dismiss, would you join me now as we consider what our kids are gonna be learning before the Lord and then we will dismiss them. So let's pray. Father, we do recognize that you are good. Uh, You are God, you're the creator of all things. Uh, Children are a blessing. Father, they're made in your image. It's our responsibility as parents, as guardians, as grandparents to train and equip them to love you, to serve you, and to submit their lives to you. Uh, Father, we get at that goal at different avenues and different ways and different processes, but ultimately your word has to be center of that. Father, we thank you for these children and the world that they're living in is corrupt. It's full of evil, uh, but you've given us your word, which is absolute truth and absolute authority that we can teach them. So, Father, whether the students are going to be dismissed now to go into children's ministry or whether they're going to sit under the proclamation of your word here, uh, would you allow their hearts to be open and free of distraction, allow their minds to process and critically think what they're learning and how this applies to them in their lives as they're going to leave this place in a matter of minutes. Father, with this, we love you and we praise you and we wish to honor you and glorify you with all that we do. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. So if you are a young person in grades one through three, you can now walk to the back of the sanctuary, go out to the right. If you're in grades four through six, bear a left. Make the L sign if you don't figure that out yet in grades four through six. And also, uh, Awana ministry happens Wednesday nights uh, for the same age level. It happens at six o'clock at 45 East Avenue. And youth group happens Sunday nights at 5.30 to 7.30 at the same location. Good morning, church. Uh, Please turn your Bibles to Judges chapter 5. A couple of guys are going to come forward right now. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand and grab one. Um, And if you don't have a Bible, you can keep that Bible. So please turn to Judges chapter 5. We're going to read that passage uh, in a moment. By the way, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here and glad to be with you today. As most of you know, TJ is down in Mexico and uh, in Pablo, Pueblo, something that starts with a P, someplace up in the mountains in Mexico, in a rural area. Actually, many of the people there don't even speak Spanish. They speak something of a native language uh, up in the mountains. And he's preaching. Oh, I'll show you. There it is. That's the church he's preaching at this morning. The stage and the floor have hay. So we'll pray that no farm animals come in and start munching on the floor. 
Uh, but he's just had an awesome time. He's been sending us pictures and um, texts as far as how everything's going, and it has been a really profitable trip. Uh, he'll be returning, uh, I believe, tomorrow night, and continue to pray for TJ as he finishes up, and he preaches today, and um, he returns tomorrow. Now, we live in an unprecedented time of peace and prosperity here in America. There are serious conflicts going on worldwide, but here we have it really good. I mean, our quality of life, if you have food in your refrigerator and a roof over your head, and you're not under the constant threat of enemies risking your own safety, we're doing quite well compared to most people in history. And it can, be, it can be difficult for us to really put this in perspective. Both uh, my grandmother and my wife, Rachel's, were French, and they grew up in 1920s and 30s and 40s France. Um, and you can just imagine what that would have been like, uh, living in a place that was occupied by the Nazis Their resources were limited. Their safety was under constant threat. They couldn't travel. They couldn't go about. They couldn't leave. Uh, They were stuck. I mean, even worse, if, if you were Jewish and endured unspeakable suffering in 1940s Europe, can you imagine the incredible relief of being liberated from that? So you've gone from having no hope, no control, and suddenly you're, you're freed and you've been liberated. How awesome would that be? Right? I mean, our grandmothers were so thrilled. They went and married two American GIs, and here we are now. <laughs> I mean, the, the emotional spectrum uh, would be shocking. There'd be celebration. There'd be joy. You'd be dancing in the streets. You'd, you'd be singing. Now, Judges chapter 5 is a bright spot in a very dark book because it is a celebration of victory. I mean, after being oppressed for 20 years, they've finally been freed and they're worshiping the God who delivered them. And I'm going to rehash the details of that story uh, a little bit later as TJ preached so well on Judges 4 last week. And Chapter 5 is told primarily from the perspective of a prophetess, Deborah. And I couldn't think of a more appropriate person to read this passage than Steph Gobin. So if you could please come up, Steph. Um, now, this is, this is 31 verses. This is a longer passage. This is longer than several books of the Bible. Um, so I ask that you have your Bibles open. And, and you read the passage along with Steph as we bring ourselves back 3,000 years and we listen to this victory song of God's deliverance. I was pretty excited when Mike asked me to read this. <laughs> if you guys know me, I get kind of jazzed about victory, and especially when it's obviously God doing it. So um, like Mike said, this isn't going to be up on the screen, but follow along because this isn't just a story to be read lightly. This is exciting. The song of Deborah and Barak. Then sang sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Ebenoam on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, Give ear, O princes, to the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, The highways were abandoned, and travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They ceased to be until I arose. 
I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel when new gods were chosen, when the war was in the gates. Was shield or spear to be seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, and you who walk by the way. To the sound of musicians at the watering places, there they repeat the righteous triumphs of the Lord, the righteous triumphs of his villagers in Israel. Then down to the gates marched the people of the Lord. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, break out in a song. Arise, Barak, lead away your captives, O son of Abinoam. Then down marched the remnant of the noble. The people of the Lord marched down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim, they, root, they marched down into the valley, following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Machir marched down the commanders, and from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. The princes of Issachar came down with Deborah and Issachar, faithful to Barak, into the valley. They rushed at his heels. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead stayed beyond the Jordan. And Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. Zebulun is a people who risk their lives to the death. Naphtali, too, on the heights of the field. The kings came, they fought, then fought the kings of Canaan. At Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo, they got no spoils of silver. From heaven, the stars fought. From their, curse, from their courses, they fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. March on my soul with might. Then loud beat the horse's hoofs with the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse Miraz, says the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants thoroughly because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Most blessed of women be Jael, the wife of Eber the Canaanite, of tent-dwelling women most blessed. He asked for water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a noble's bowl. She sent her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. He lay still. Between her feet, he sank. He fell. Where he sank, there he fell, dead. Out of the window, she peered. The mother of Sisera wailed through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the hoofbeats of his chariots? Her wisest princesses answer. Indeed, she answers herself. Have they not found and divided the spoil? A womb or two for every man? Spoil of dyed materials for Sisera? Spoil of dyed materials embroidered? Two pieces of dyed work embroidered for the neck as a spoil? So... May all your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. And the land had rest for 40 years. Amen. Thank you, Steph. Or should I call you Deborah? <laughs> Let's take a moment to pray as we study this passage of God's word. Heavenly Father, your sovereign hand works behind the scene and you are powerful and able to save. Lord, the stars fought out against Sisera and you took an impossible situation and you delivered your people. We praise you that you deliver sinful men from the domination and the slavery of sin and you set the captives free and you redeem them and you did it at a great cost through the precious blood of your son, Jesus Christ, 
we can be freed from slavery and given a new life. We praise you for who you are. We praise you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would assist us as we study your word. And more importantly than even understanding it, that we would apply it to our hearts. And we would be willing servants of the cross. And in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you were here last week, you'll remember the story behind this victory song. Israel had been subdued by Jabin, king of Canaan, and his evil henchman Sisera, this military general, for 20 years. And so God calls Deborah, the prophetess, and Barak, the judge, to go up against Sisera's 900 chariots of iron. Um, I mean, it's like a bunch of barely equipped peasants against a bunch of tanks. And there God miraculously does the impossible. And he delivers Israel's army against this incredible force. It takes place in a river called the Kishon Valley. And um, it's called Herosheth Hagaim here in Judges 4. That place would later be known in Revelation as Armageddon. So the Canaanite army is completely destroyed by Israel. But their leader... Sisera runs off alone and he finds this tent of this woman named Jael and um, he takes shelter there. And, and uh, Jael lets him think that he's safe and then she pounds a tent peg through his head as Steph so eloquently read. So now in chapter 5 we have this victory song. Uh, Chapter 4 was kind of the historical event, and chapter 5 is a theological response, praising God for what he did, and it clues us into some of the details of how all this transpired. And as we unpack this ancient Hebrew song, there are two themes that are woven throughout, and it's not in your outline, but it's something you'll want to write down because they're extremely relevant to us. The first is this, God providentially works behind the scene, S-E-E-N, he works behind the scene. Everything happens because of his power, his sovereign control. He's working in ways that we can't see, but he is always there. God providentially works behind the scenes. Secondly, that there is blessing for the willing obedience of his people. God blesses willing obedience. So we have God's providential control, and then we have man's free, eager response to what God has done. Now, as we unpack the song, you'll see the focus narrow. In in the first part, the first 11 verses, it speaks of Israel as a nation, and then it narrows down to 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, and then finally at the end, it gives us this little picture of two women. So it goes from a nation to groups within a nation to two individuals, and you'll see these themes of God's sovereignty and man's obedience throughout this text. And I know you guys are waiting for me to say that there's going to be a statement on the screen. And I will not fulfill that desire until the end. Um, Because I want to unfold this as as we progress. Um, So let's start then at the beginning of the song. I want to look at first a nation's desperate situation. You'll remember that TJ read verses 6 through 8 last week. And it says that the people were so terrified that the highways were abandoned. You had to take these little back roads to avoid being harassed by Sisera's Gestapo. People left their homes where they were. They fled from the villages. They dwelled in mountains and caves because they were so afraid of this horrible oppressor, this despot. Commerce and agriculture virtually stopped. They're probably barely surviving. Their weapons were confiscated. 
They couldn't defend themselves. They were at the mercy of the Canaanite army who would just keep them firmly under their thumb. Can you imagine being in this generation and trying to raise children? And the promised land in which they were dwelling didn't seem so much like a promised land. How did they get into this mess? Verse 8 says, When new gods were chosen, then war was in the gates. Sometimes you find yourself in an awful predicament and you have trials in your life and it's no fault of your own. But there are other times when we create messes of our own making and and that was the case with Israel. Now verse 5 talks about how the mountains quaked before the Lord at Sinai. And this is referencing all the way back to Deuteronomy several hundred years before when God in his love had chosen Israel as his special people to love and represent him, to reflect his glory to the nations, and he made a covenant with this people, Israel. And he says in Deuteronomy 28, if you walk in my ways and you faithfully obey my voice, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth, and all these blessings will come upon you. You won't be running from the Gestapo. You won't lack food and shelter. You're going to find blessing. And he even made promises of great material prosperity to this nation. But that's only secondary to the greatest blessing, which would be to know the God of the universe, to have a relationship with this awesome God of love and to be his special people. But there was one condition to this promise. It was to live for him, to live exclusively, to serve God alone, not to turn to the right or to the left and worship other guys, to serve the God who actually exists, who actually made them and loves them because idols don't love you. God is right to demand exclusive devotion in the way that a spouse can expect the other spouse not to have something else on the side. But in Israel, even after God had made this beautiful, wonderful covenant of love with them, they chose new gods. And sometimes you... You look at the scripture, you see how many times Israel failed over and over and over again, and you think, what's the deal? Like, what what is wrong with these people? Why do they keep failing over and over again? Didn't they ever learn? And I believe that has to do with what those idols claimed to offer. They didn't go worship Baal because... They wanted to try another religion. They worshipped Baal because of what they thought they could get out of it. Uh, The name Baal means Lord or Master. Uh, A Baal, there are many Baals, usually it's in the plural, um, would be the Lord or Master over a local geography. And people would worship of that geography, they'd worship that particular Baal so that he would give them what they wanted that their flocks would be healthy, that their fields would be productive. The people around them, the Canaanite people said, hey, you got to worship Baal if you want to get stuff, if you want to be prosperous. And that is the lust of the eyes. Asherah was the goddess who complimented Baal. Uh, She was sensuous. We hear of these Asherah poles in the Old Testament where people would worship around them. And the hope in worshiping Asherah is that she would sleep with Baal and they would produce offspring and thereby would fertilize the land. And this particular worship of Asherah involved the use, and the scripture speaks of this, of temple prostitutes, where the worshipers themselves would come together with them, hoping that Baal and Asherah would also get the idea and procreate themselves. 
And you see how the worship of Asherah was a way to religiously justify immorality, the lust of the flesh. Now, the worship of the Canaanite god Moloch was the worst. An idol of Moloch would be something like a bull with outstretched hands. And with, within that idol would be a, just a roaring fire within and, and outside of it. And worshiping Molech would involve taking your own child and placing it on his burning hands and sacrificing your own flesh and blood to this false god. Drums would be beat very loudly around it so you couldn't hear the cries of your own child. This actually happened. People in Israel actually did this. And you think to yourself, why would anyone do this? What would possess anyone to do that to their own child? Well, the word Moloch, it, it means king. And it's because Moloch, king, would promise you something kingly if you worshipped, worshipped him. And that would be honor and glory in one-upmanship among your peers. And people would go to such lengths that they'd sacrifice their own children to get it. The boastful pride of life. So the Israelites, they didn't forsake God for idols because they thought these idols of wood and stone were better to worship. They served them because they appealed to our fundamental worldly desires. As 1 John 2.15 tells us, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. And 3,000 years later, we still feel so drawn to the things that appeal to our pride and our senses, and our desire for more. And if you love the things of the world and you live for them, don't wonder why your life is a mess and that you find yourself in a desperate situation because idols always deceive. But in God's grace and infinite wisdom, it's in those moments of desperation that his grace is shown. And he causes us to cry out to God. It's often when you see how incredibly hopeless you are without God, then you can appreciate how mighty and powerful and awesome and sovereign he is. Right? If you're a Christian, that, that's where we all were in our sin. Totally hopeless, we were without God, serving a cruel master with no way of escape. And then God, when it seemed impossible, rescued you. And he picked you up and he saved you, not because of how wonderful you are. You were not wonderful in your sin. It's because of how wonderful he is. And in his love, he sent his own son to die for your sin. And he takes your sins, as horrible as they are, and he casts them into the sea so you could be forgiven. And you could be made spotless and pure before God. And when you deserved death and condemnation, he adopted you into his family. And he calls you his son or daughter. And so God saved this nation of Israel after they had messed things up royally. And they finally came to their wits by raising up Deborah and Barak to deliver them. And, and things seemed pretty bleak until verse 7 where it says, I, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. And you know the story from last week and God miraculously delivers them. But now the song takes a shift from Israel as a nation and it progresses to ten tribes, secondly, determination or lack thereof. By the way, there are twelve tribes of Israel. Two of them here aren't mentioned. I'm not sure why. But here we have ten tribes, determination. So God has appointed an end 
He's sovereign, he's in control. Not even a sparrow falls to the ground without his knowing. But he has also appointed a means to that end. So God has already won the victory, but he expects us to follow his plan, and he uses us, he uses people to accomplish it. It's an easy thing for the God who spoke the galaxies into existence to free us from our desperate situation. Why is it such a hard thing for us to follow him? So this this middle section is a roll call, so to speak, where Deborah calls out these various tribes and regions in Israel according to their response and how they responded to this call in fighting against them. And for the first few tribes, there's this willing, wholehearted obedience starting in verse 13. Then march down the remnant of the noble, the people of the Lord, march down for me against the mighty. And here he starts to list them. From Ephraim, their root, they march down into the valley. Following you, Benjamin, with your kinsmen. From Macher, march down the commanders. And from Zebulun, those who bear the lieutenant's staff. Verse 15, the princes of Issachar came with Deborah. And Issachar, faithful to Barak, into the valley, they rushed at his heels. So here are these tribes marching downhill against the enemy. Remember, they're, they're ill-equipped barely trained foot soldiers getting ready to assault the modern equivalent of 900 tanks. And they're facing this impossible situation, but they confidently push forward. Literally, it it says they rushed at his heels, eagerly and obediently at the risk of their own lives. I mean, zealous and willing, even joyfully going into battle for the Lord because they know that God has promised victory. But as Deborah continues this roll call in the middle of verse 15, we're we're perplexed, even though God has said, I will win, we're perplexed with disappointment at some of these tribes. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Why did you sit still among the sheepfolds to hear the whistling for the flocks? And he repeats that statement again. Among the clans of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. You can be deeply emotionally impacted by God's word and have great searching of heart. But if you don't follow it with action, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. And here are people who are emotionally impacted by the call, and they're thinking it over, and they're discussing it, and they're pondering it, but they do nothing. Verse 17, Gilead stayed behind the Jordan. Right? They're like, we're too far. we got to cross the river. This isn't our battle. Let Ephraim and Zebulun do it. And they're just apathetic. They didn't care one way or the other. And Dan, why did he stay with the ships? Asher sat still at the coast of the sea, staying by his landings. I mean, Dan and Asher, they're too busy with their business on the coast to care about the call of God. Life gets in the way, and they don't show up. It shows where their hearts really are. And worse is in verse 23, this cursing of the city of Miraz. And I don't know what this city was. I believe it's the only time in the Bible this is mentioned. But they played it safe. They didn't want to get involved. Their brothers needed help. And they didn't do it. And they are cursed by the angel of God. They tried to save their lives and tried to avoid what seemed like to them a suicide mission. And they ended up just getting cursed by God himself. So we have this contrast. There's willing, obedient people. And then we have the other tribes that were too busy, too far, too safe, too introspective to do anything. So what happened? It says in verses 19 through 22, The kings came, that's the kings of Canaan, they fought. Then fought the kings of Canaan at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They got no spoils of silver. 
From heaven the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. So to the casual observer, or if you had only read Judges 4, this battle seemed local, but God was working behind the scene. Even the stars fought. There's irony here because the Canaanites worshipped the stars, and here they are against them in this hyperbolic picture of the battle. All creation was against Sisera, and God delivered Israel through the rain. Remember Baal's the storm god? (laughs) This is how God delivers them. 21, the torrent Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent Kishon, march on my soul with might. Then loud beat the horse's hooves with galloping, galloping of his steeds. So you can picture this battle. Here comes Sisera with his 900 tanks rushing down into the valley during the dry season to destroy Israel. And out of nowhere come buckets and buckets of rain. Kishon was normally a dried up book, but it quickly became a raging river. And God turns Sisera's advantage into a horrible disadvantage because those iron chariots get stuck in the mud and then the horses are just disconnected, running wild. And the Israelites' disadvantage, their light armor and crude weapon, crude weapons become their advantage. And these willing disciples who trusted God and marched into the battle slaughter the enemy. Never underestimate the resources and power of God. There is no such thing as a hopeless situation for a willing disciple. If you have nothing but God, you have everything you need. And if you have everything but God, you have nothing. God has already won the battle. And he desires willing disciples who are eager and ready to fight. So now the song shifts gears again. And it had focused on the lens of Israel to the lens of ten of the tribes. And now third, to two women's destinies. And I just love, I love this little window um, to these women's lives. We're like flies on the wall watching these scenes. And so first there's jail. Verse 24 says, right, they just cursed Miraz for not helping. Verse 24, most blessed of women be jail. This is the same accolade given to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Remember the scene with jail? Sisera's running. He's out of breath. He finally feels like he's gotten away and he gets to her tent and he's dying of thirst and he says, water. And and she gives him milk and she hides him under a rug. And he's absolutely exhausted and he goes to sleep. And I just love the zeal of this Hebrew poetry. In English, our poetry rhymes. In Hebrew, it repeats. It repeats thoughts and words. Verse 26, she sent her hand for the tent peg. And so there's like this close-in frame, and you see her hand with the tent peg. And her right hand to the workman's mallet. She struck Sisera, she crushed his head, she shattered and pierced his temple. Boom. Between her feet he sank, he fell, he lay still. Between her feet he sank, he fell. There he, where he sank, there he fell. Dead. Don't you love it? And maybe some of you think, oh, poor Sisera, <laughs> what an awful way to die. But, but think of it this way. This guy is worse than Osama bin Laden. He's like Hitler who's been dominating these people carelessly for 20 years. They've had to flee to the mountains. And here's jail. And she sees her chance. And she sends that tent peg straight through his brain. You can't make this up. And the scripture is savoring this victory blow. You know, like when you chew a steak and and you just slowly 
chew it and you, you take your time and it's so good. That's kind of what the Hebrew is doing here. They're taking their time to enjoy this. They're rejoicing in how God has won and they're on his team. But now the scene shifts from that Bedouin tent out in the wilderness to a nobleman's palace. And here's another woman, the mother of Sisera. And she's looking out the window, waiting for him to come home, and she's worried. Where's Sisera? Why is he late? Did something happen? And her princes, her princesses answer her, and she assures herself with this false hope that he has had such a great victory that they're still dividing the spoil. Surely, she thinks, they're still out raping and pillaging. Do you see the callousness of this woman? Verse 30 says, a womb or two for every man. Literally, these, the, the career of Sisera and his men is to go out and pillage and take advantage of women. And you're meant to see how horrible and evil and calloused Sisera and his army and his mother were. All the while, while his mother's waiting, Sisera's laying there with a tent peg in his, hand, in his head. And that man who raped and terrorized women and made their lives a nightmare for 20 years was taken down by one woman who became his nightmare. And I just, I love the irony. They should make a TV show out of this. And the whole song comes to a climax with the most important line in the whole episode. It's verse 31. So may all of your enemies perish, O Lord, but your friends be like the sun as he rises in his might. You might as well say, your kingdom come, your will be done. God wins. And that's, that's worth celebrating that. Let's join him in this. Let's be like the sun rising in his might. Let's join this God of victory who always wins. Now remember in the beginning when I said I was going to hold the statement until the end? I know you've been wanting to fill in that blank. You probably guessed what it was already. I'm going to give it to you now. Here it is. Because God rescues sinners, I willingly give my life in praise to him. I willingly give my life. You know, the song, it's not stuck in history for a certain people at a certain time. It's a message for God's people today in our spiritual battles. Our weapons are different. Our opponent is different, but we do fight a battle. And God wants willing disciples who rush in at his heels down the mountain to fight the enemy. As Ephesians 6.12 says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So what do you do? Take up the armor of God. Stand firm. Take up God's weapons, truth and righteousness and faith and God's word and fight sin and fight darkness. Put your life at stake and risk everything for the greatest cause there ever has been and ever will be. Many of us aren't called to go to a Muslim country and be martyred for the gospel. But we are called to give up our life for the glory of someone else and to be willing and freely give everything to the one who gave up his own life to save us. You are a fool if you play it safe. Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Playing it safe ensures your destruction. So do great things for God. Take risks 
for God. Live for him. Love him with enthusiasm. Take a tent peg. Drive it into your sin. Defeat the idols in your life and wage war against sin and be a soldier of the cross. Are you willing to risk your reputation to honor Christ? Are you willing to risk the approval of those around you by just sharing Jesus with them? Are you afraid that they'll think of you unintelligent or simple or prudish just because what you believe in the gospel affects how you live and what you talk about? Who cares? Who cares what other people think of you? The only thing that matters is what God thinks of you. Let his love motivate you. The God who loved us so much when we were enslaved by our sin and living for ourselves, came into this world and he died for our sins that we could be forgiven and he rescues sinners. How could you not want to respond to that love and giving your life to him? And you give your body a willing sacrifice, not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. In, in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis talks about this call of the gospel, the call of Christ to repentance and wholehearted, willing service to the Lord. He says, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent as well as the ones you think wicked, the whole outfit. And I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. God is looking for willing disciples. Are you willing to risk your life for him? Don't be like Zebulun who had this great searching of heart but did nothing. Or like Gilead, who felt the whole thing is just a big inconvenience. Or like Asher and Dan, who were too busy with the cares of the world and with life. Or the city of Miraz, who played it safe. Jesus Christ has given himself for you. And he calls you not just to make him a part of your life, but to give up your life and live for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you because of who you are. And in your love, you sent your son to give his life for us. Forgive us for our half-heartedness, for playing it safe, for not taking risks for you. Because you have paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. Make us a people who are so zealous and willing to serve you that you would just turn this community upside down for the gospel because of the willing servants in this room. And in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and uh, have our benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. You're dismissed.